dollar, dollar, dollar. Dirt and money, no so. Had to go and get it, ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't declare me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long, get my team strong. Let me run away from my problems. Yo, what's good, original crew, man? We're back. Balling. You see a player. We got top three crazy ways people escape death, part two. We got part two uh, today. Was looking for part one, didn't find part one, found part two and three. So if y'all know where part one is, uh, please spam it up in the comment section. Uh, help us out. Uh, <laughs> right. Hey, hey, because we, we're trying to give y'all everything uh, that y'all might want to see. But this should be a good one, though. Top three crazy ways people escape death. Have you ever had a... Uh... Oh, I know. I know. You want to tell people your story? Mm -mm. I'm a survivor. I ain't gonna get... <laughs> no. You couldn't catch the rhythm of the stroke, huh? You know, but I had a, I had a couple, I think. <laughs> catch the rhythm <laughs> No, that's that's one. You want to say, you want to no, tell, tell your story? no. Let's let's you, go. You have before. I don't want to, cause y'all try to y'all try to play me, like I like you know. See, see, y'all try to play him, man. No, you did too. Nah, no. y'all was all in cahoots. <laughs> <laughs> no, cause you said I drowned, and everybody keeps saying, "Girl, you didn't drown if you still here with us." You can drown, and somebody no. can bring you back. <laughs> you ain't get brought back. You went gone. God girl. brought me back. You went gone, girl. <laughs> Hey, so if you also have any uh, nerd death or something crazy to happen to you, uh, let us know in the comment section down below. We be checking y'all. We be checking some of y'all stories yeah. out for real, for real. So with that being said, mm -hmm. make sure you check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go, man. You want to further support, all you have to do is check out down below. Also, if you enjoyed today's video. Like it or a thumbs up. I would highly appreciate it. Also, hey, if y'all see anything else out there, spam us up. Uh, we find it interesting and Feel as though everybody would like to see. We always do it, man. So y'all let us know. The title that is. Yeah, we don't previously watch anything. We just make sure it's. The title. The title sounds interesting. Yeah. And the channel. Because some channels. The, yeah. We try to avoid for, you know, certain purposes. Yeah. Let's go. Today, we're going to look at three of the most incredible survival stories of all time. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do, and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button over to your house for Oreos and milk, but replace all of their Oreos cream filling with Play-Doh. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss- My bad. My bad, the Play-Dohs. Calm down. Play-Dohs. Did you ever eat Play-Doh? I ain't know. Up? Did I ever eat Play-Doh like the Play-Doh supposed to be eight? But you no, know No, I did not eat Play-Doh. I didn't eat Play-Doh. I knew what it smelled like to not even want to. Play-Doh stink. <laughs> and be dry after, after yeah, you leave it out for a while. Leave it out. I never ate it, but I just. With yeah, like, Play-Doh. Yeah. Also, please subscribe to like channel type and eight turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1994, 39-year-old Mauro Prosperi took part in the brutal Marathon des Sables, which is a six-day endurance race covering 155 miles through the Sahara Desert. The competition was known as one of the toughest in the world, but Prosperi was a former Olympic athlete, and he kept himself in unbelievable physical shape. He was also a police officer back in Italy, which kept him even more active, so he felt ready. The competition's desert terrain was so dangerous that participants had to indicate where they wanted their bodies sent if they did not survive the race. Oh, in preparation wow. for the race, Prosperi would run 25 miles a day for weeks leading up to it, and he would give himself less and less water as he was running to get accustomed to dehydration. But despite how much he was training and his incredible athletic resume that showed he's someone that can probably do this, his wife was very concerned. But he would tell her, you know, the worst thing that's gonna happen to me is I'll get a little sunburned. 
The race kicked off at its starting point in Morocco on April 10th, and initially it was going very smoothly. Prosperi was always at the front of the pack, and he was always the first Italian to finish that day's stage. And so when he would finish, he would go to his tent and he'd put an Italian flag on the outside to show the other Italians doing the race where they could find him to come inside and chat. And he would say that part of the race was really fun. Then things went wrong on the fourth day during the longest and most difficult phase of the race. When he set out that morning, it was already very windy and he found himself in this section between these two big sand dunes and the pace setters had already gone way ahead, so he's totally alone. And then out of nowhere, this massive sandstorm kicks mm. up and completely blinds him. He can't go anywhere because he can't see where he's going. And so he manages to kind of feel his way to this rock where he gets down behind this rock and he thinks to himself, I'll just wait it out and then continue on. But the sandstorm raged for eight hours. And when it was finally done, wow. it was totally dark outside. So Prosperi couldn't see anything. So he decides, you know what? I'm gonna have to sleep on the dunes and tomorrow morning I'll have to get up and keep going. And his biggest concern at this point was not that he was in a survival situation. It was, man, I was in fourth place in this race. And now with this huge setback, I'm probably gonna finish last. Uh -huh. And so when he went to sleep that night, all he was thinking about is, man, I gotta get up and go as fast as I can so I don't finish last tomorrow. But when the sun came up the next morning, Prosperi looked around and he realized he had a much bigger problem. The sandstorm had been so strong, it had completely altered the landscape. The dunes had all moved around. He had no points of reference. And so even though he had a map and he had a compass, he had no way to orient himself, so he had no idea what direction to go. Anybody that competed in this race really needed to be self-sufficient. And so Prosperi had a knife, he had plenty of dehydrated food, he had a sleeping bag, but he had very little water. He had about a half bottle of water because at each of the checkpoints during the day, the race officials would give you all of this water. And the idea was you would drink it all by the time you got to your next checkpoint. And he had not made it to the next checkpoint and so was very low on water. As he's looking around, realizing this is a really bad situation, he thinks to himself, you know, other runners must have had this same thing happen to them. They probably had to hunker down yesterday during the sandstorm and they're, they're just waking up now. They're looking around. I'm bound to find someone. We'll link up. And That's scary, bruh. Just to be out there in the Sahara? Like that? I'll say the only thing is, at least he does have a sleeping bag, the, the food, food, but the lack of water is what was, uh, scares me the most. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But, like, he's, like did everyone else continue running? Just run That's through the... That's what I'm wondering. And they might have. I don't know. That's scary. Orman there. They're just waking up now. They're looking around. I'm bound to find someone. We'll link up and we will get to the end of this race and we'll be just fine. And so he runs to the top of a sand dune and looks around expecting to see someone. And he doesn't. There's no one in all directions. It's just completely barren desert. And so he leaves that sand dune, goes up another one and does the same thing. He's looking around and there's nobody there. And over the course of several hours, he was just running to the peaks of these different sand dunes, expecting to see someone not seeing anyone, becoming more panicked and expending more energy. And finally, by the late afternoon, when he's sweating profusely and the sun is bearing down on him and he still hasn't seen anyone, he realizes he's gonna die if he keeps doing this. And he needs to be smart about this. And so at this point, he went into survival mode. And he decided that the only times he's gonna move are gonna be at night and in the early morning hours, because those are the times when the sun is not up and it's still pretty cool and he can conserve energy that way. He also began peeing into bottles and began conserving his urine to drink later when he did run out of water. And so over the next two days, he conserved his energy, but he was just kind of drifting through the desert and he wasn't really getting anywhere. He didn't know if he was making progress because he had nothing to go to. He wasn't seeing anyone and he was starting to realize the situation is getting worse and worse by the minute. And then in an incredible stroke of luck, he comes across this Muslim shrine in the middle of nowhere that mm. Bedouins would use as they traveled across the desert. Mm. And he ran inside hoping that there'd be a person in there. And there was a person in there, but they were dead inside of a coffin. But he was happy that he now had shelter over his head okay. and this felt like progress. He began taking stock of his new surroundings, and when he was inside the shrine looking up into the ceiling, he saw it was lined with hundreds of bats. And at this point, he's really hungry, he's really thirsty, and so he climbed up into the rafters and began grabbing handfuls of bats and drinking their blood. After drinking the blood of 20 bats, he used some of the wood that was inside of the shrine, and he built a fire outside, and that would be his way to signal plane. Is that not dangerous? <laughs> like, to drink the blood of... 
Let's take a I gotta do my, I gotta do some look up some well, shit. Well, I guess not. I mean, she's still here. I gotta look up some stuff, man. Wood that was inside of the shrine, and he built a fire outside, and that would be his way to signal planes and helicopters going overhead that he assumed would be out looking for him. And so he sets the fire, and he comes back inside, expecting, you know, over the next couple of days, someone's bound to find him, but nobody does. And four days go by, and three separate times, a plane or a helicopter flew directly over him. He's got his fire going, he's out there flagging him down, but nobody saw him. And so at the end of those four days, he's now been out in the desert roaming around for nearly a week. And he's starting to realize that this is the end. He's not going to survive this. No one knows where he is. No one's seen him so far. He's running out of supplies. This is it. And so knowing he was staring down a long, painful death, either by dehydration or starvation, he decided he was going to expedite it. And he would say later that he did not feel sad about this. It just was a logical choice he was making. He figured this way, if he died inside of the shrine, the shrine was more likely to be found than if he had died somewhere out in the desert where sand would cover him up. And so he said it was more likely people would find the shrine and therefore find him. And so there'd be closure for his family. And so Prosperi took a piece of charcoal from the fire, wrote a message to his wife, and then cut his wrists and laid down expecting never to wake up again. But the next morning he woke up and he had barely bled because his blood was too thick. He literally could not bleed to death. He took this as a sign that he was supposed to live and he suddenly felt motivated to survive. He decided to leave the shrine and follow the advice that one of the race organizers had given all of them at the start, which was if you get lost, follow the clouds you can see just beyond the horizon at dawn, there you will find civilization. So mm. Prosperi hopped up and began heading towards what he believed were those clouds. He walked for days in the desert, grabbing snakes and lizards off the ground and eating them raw. He said his inner caveman came Hello. out like his primal desire to live Ooh. and he had no problems eating the things he was eating. Prosperi grew so dehydrated he couldn't even urinate anymore. So he began drinking the liquid inside of succulents that grew inside of dried up riverbeds and he also began sucking out the moisture in his wet wipes that were in his backpack. On the ninth day Prosperi saw a little shepherd girl off in the distance and she saw him and she was scared of him and she turned and ran away. Oh. And at first Prosperi is devastated because he has no strength to chase after her but she had actually gone down to her tribe and told them about this strange man wandering the desert and they came running up over the dunes and they brought him in and they gave him food and drink and they sent someone to get police. After police picked him up and brought him back to their headquarters, he discovered he had walked over 181 miles from where he had gotten wow. lost on the course all the way to Algeria. His family and race organizers had gone out looking for him after he went missing, but all they ever found was his shoelace and so they assumed he was dead. It would take him two years to fully recover from this ordeal, but after he did, he went on to run eight more desert races. <laughs> Damn. He was like, look, at, at this point, nothing's about to stop me. I'm, I'm better than all y'all motherfuckers. <laughs> That's crazy. That's literally the will to I'm live. So, right? I'm so glad he's seen the little girl. I'm so glad she went and was like, hey, it's this weird man. Da -da -da, Roman. Uh, they helped think... him, took him in. I don't think I could have did that, though. What? I just survived. And you know some. You, you know when people know, say though. things like that, I'm like, you're never, you don't know because you've never been put in a situation yeah. to have to, like, go survive. into survival mode. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so people you, are like, well, you know, every day I'm, you know, but that's different, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, you that's never know what crazy, you can do. Though. That's why I would never, like, say, I don't know if I could ever, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I get you, but I'm just like, it's the Man. thing I don't I wouldn't want to have to be put in that situation. You know what I'm saying? But hey. I, like, I still got I got a lot of questions I still want to know though. What happened to the other races? Like how you get off course? Did the other races keep running? I guess so. I got a lot of questions still. Maybe they just was like, okay, whoever in the front are still running because they ahead they a little bit ahead, so I'm just gonna follow follow, follow the leader. And it's kind of probably what they did. You know. You never know. I'm wondering, did anyone, you know? Or was anybody, did anybody turn around? Was anybody still around him? I have a lot of questions, I bro. I need to holler uh, Prosperity. Like, I need I need to know. Holler. His name, Prosperity? Why you? Off the notes. Miss, I don't take notes. This is my notes. No, but I, I didn't get his name, though. But I'm just yeah. like, like, for his name to be that. I'm just like, anyway. Oh, I, like, I get, I get where you're going. I get where you're going. 
<laughs> I'll give you go on. Stop. <laughs> In 2012, 35-year-old Jose Alvarenga was an extremely experienced fisherman, having spent years and years commercially fishing. In November of that year, Jose volunteered to do a 30-hour deep-sea fishing shift for his company off the coast of his hometown in Mexico. He hoped he'd be able to catch some sharks, marlins, and sailfish, three of the more lucrative fish you can catch. Unfortunately, the guy Jose usually went deep sea fishing oh. with was not able to go at the last minute, but Jose still really wanted to go out and do this shift. And so he took the only other fisherman in their company that was willing to go or that could go. And it was a 23 year old, extremely inexperienced, brand new fisherman named Ezekiel Cordova. And while Jose knew he was not gonna be a huge asset out on the seas, he figured, you know, it's a short trip and we're not that far off from shore. So you know what, he's fine, I'll take him. On November 17th, the pair set out on their 24 foot fiberglass skiff with a small motor. On board were various fishing tools, a radio and a large ice box to hold all the fish they were going to catch. Once they reached the area they were gonna be fishing, their trip immediately started paying off. And within just a couple of hours, they had already almost completely overloaded the ice box. Their luck was so good that when they saw a storm coming in, they decided to wait and continue to catch as many fish as they possibly could before heading in at the very last minute. But the storm that was rolling in was like the storm of the century. And by the time they did turn around to head into shore, it was too late. They got caught up in this wicked storm where the rain was so intense, they literally could not see to shore. They tried to use their compass and other instruments to navigate to shore, but between the winds and the waves and the fact that their boat was so heavy from the nearly thousand pounds of fish they had caught, they were just really unable to get anywhere near shore. When the storm just continued to rage and they were just kind of floundering in the water, they decided they needed to dump their catch. So they dumped Damn. all 1,000 plus pounds of fish back into the water. But even then with a more agile boat, the storm was so severe, they just could not navigate effectively. And so Jose turned off the engine and told Ezekiel that their best chance here was to just wait it out. And once it was done, they would head back into shore. But that storm continued to rage for five days. The torrential rain never stopped. What? The waves were huge. The winds were awful. Wow. And before long, they were getting pulled out to sea and had no idea where they were. Now, they had only planned to be out for 30 hours. So they did not have much in the way of supplies. And so after a few days, they had run out of food and they had run out of water. But luckily, because it was raining so much, they were able to drink the rainwater. But the real immediate problem they were facing is over the course of those five days, the storm was just battering their boat. And by the time the storm cleared, their boat was ruined. Their motor had been torn off and was just gone. Their electronics were busted and all of their fishing gear was either damaged or gone. There was enough charge in the radio for Jose to call back to his boss on the mainland and send a mayday message, but the radio died before they got a return message, so they weren't able to confirm if anybody on land was going to come looking for them. Left with minimal supplies, no radio, no motor, Jose and Ezekiel just had to hope somebody on the mainland heard their message, and they slowly began to adjust to life at sea. Jose was able to leap into the water and catch turtles, fish, seabirds, and jellyfish with his bare hands. And so that's what they ate. And then the two of them would try to catch rainwater whenever they could, but the majority of the time they had to drink their own urine and turtle blood. Despite their initial optimism that their boss had probably heard their Mayday message and would be sending people out to get them, as days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, they realized that probably what? no one was coming to find them. Days months? Weeks, weeks, months. We now I understand a couple of days. A week. I understand even like a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, that's months. What I'm saying. months, motherfucker. Y'all ain't coming out here. Yeah, bitch, I need y'all to search the whole ocean. Right, even if you didn't get the message, you know they didn't return. Bitch, come out, look for me. Unless they were looking and just never like went out far as far, far as where they were. Because you know, but that's why I said you need to scour the whole ocean for me. Something, Do like something. come, come, give it your all. Look at me. Even if you gotta go, we gotta put in one of the big boats to go miles. Yeah, send it. I'm trying to come home. Use all your resources. I'm trying to come home. <laughs> more than your resources, more than what you can afford. Somebody will pay it. Okay, well. Hey, yeah. even if I gotta pay it back, y'all work. At least I'm alive and I ain't die. See, we just out there cooking on the. Nah, stop it.
Now their only hope was a plane spotted them flying overhead, or perhaps they could drift into a shipping lane and a boat could spot them. But without any way of navigating their boat, they really were just leaving it up to luck. Despite their dire situation, Jose stayed really positive and he focused on catching food and catching water and he tracked the time really diligently by tracking the phases of the moon. Ezekiel, however, just did not have a significant role on the boat because he just wasn't skilled enough and so he found himself sitting in the boat most of the time doing a whole lot of nothing and he fell into a deep depression. He was not accustomed to being out on the water the way Jose was. Jose had been raised on the water. He practically only ate seafood and a lot of it he ate raw. So in a way, Jose was kind of at home, Ezekiel was not. And then by the fourth month, Ezekiel just could no longer stomach the food they were eating. He would just get sick every single time. And so he just kind of gave up and he stopped eating. And even though Jose urged him to eat and would get him food, he didn't eat it and eventually he starved to death. Even though Ezekiel was not a huge asset in terms of helping them survive, yeah. he did provide Jose an enormous amount of comfort. It was yeah. like you had your partner in crime here. And then once he died, Jose was alone for the first time in nearly half a year wow. and he fell into a very dark depression. Wow. And for six days, he did not touch Ezekiel's body. He just sat there and stared at him and even contemplated taking his own life. But on the seventh wow. day, he doesn't know what it was, but he had this sudden urge to want to survive. And so he gave Ezekiel a kind of makeshift funeral. He said a few words and then disposed of his body in the ocean. And then after that, Jose became laser focused on just surviving. And survive he would for another nine months, all by himself, in the middle lying. of the ocean. Just I know you lying. Over a year. I have to do the math. Wow. Real quick. Over a year in the ocean by your damn self. Let, let, me, let me finish because I got some for another nine months mm -hmm. all by himself out in the middle of the ocean just floating around drinking turtle's blood and drinking his own pee but after those nine months he would finally see the thing he had been dreaming about land he had mm. managed to drift all the way to the marshall islands so he leapt out of his boat he swam to shore and there was a hut right on the beach he knocked on the hut and a couple came to the door and they were totally shocked to see this guy wow. I mean, he didn't look too good and they couldn't even believe his story. They, they couldn't believe that he had survived for so long in the water. But they quickly brought him inside. They gave him some food and drink and they contacted authorities and he was saved. His parents and young daughter, when they found out he was alive, they were overjoyed. They, along with everybody else, believed he had perished. They had sent out a search party for them and they'd found pieces of their boat that had broken off in the storm. And so they assumed, you know, they must have sank. Then, in a strange turn of events, shortly after he got home, people began accusing him of lying about what happened. People said he looked too good to have been out on the open ocean for 14 months. He should have been emaciated, and at the very least, he should have had scurvy. But doctors would say he ate so many turtles and seabirds that he was pretty well fed. And turtles and seabirds contain a high level of vitamin C that would have protected him from scurvy. Other skeptics said scurvy. it would have been impossible for his skiff to float the 6,000 miles to the Marshall Islands where he ultimately found land. But then a study done at the University of Hawaii confirmed there was a current that would have pulled him from the coast of Mexico straight into the Marshall Islands. And then lastly, Ezekiel Cordoba's family accused Jose of killing Ezekiel and eating his body for sustenance. That's the only way he was able to survive. But Ezekiel roundly rejected that and took multiple lie detector tests that proved he did not do that. Today, Jose lives in a small town in El Salvador, completely surrounded by land, and he says he doesn't go anywhere near the water. Oh. Bro, even if I kill Ezekiel and, and, and consume him, it's not going to allow me to survive for over a year. Over a year, yeah. His body ain't... Come on, now. Some people just got to think. God damn it. And the only thing I was like, mm, I guess I wouldn't have wanted to, you know, this because eventually, you know, the body would have decayed and stuff. I'm like, the only other thing what you wanted me to do, leave him on the boat so that y'all can at least, you know, yeah. like he. He died at sea. Typically with fishermen and, gave up and with, sailors, um, if you die at sea and they really can't get you back, yeah. they put your body to, to the sea. That's just, sad. That's sad. That's sad. That's really sad that they was out there that long. One, the family thought that they had perished. Well, you know, Jose family thought that he had perished. It's sad that Ezekiel's like, okay, I'm done. I can't do this. And he gave up eating. I get why also the search party was called off because once you do go out there, you see 
hey, they're missing pieces of the boat and the motor's not there. And you searching, and you seeing bits and pieces of things that possibly you can only is, assume the worst. You only assume like, hey, they didn't make it. Yeah, like, especially the storm was five days. The currents, like you just putting everything together, it was yeah. like you know, for a lot of people, there was like, there's no way that they survived that. Yeah, but will it's all at, about will, man. Will and endurance to. And then the fact that for Jose, that he already had the experience of being on the water. Yeah, because he was 35 and then Ezekiel was 23. Ezekiel ain't got enough experience compared to... <laughs> Ezekiel ain't got enough... Uh, oh, I already... Oh. Enough experience as, as yeah, uh, so. Jose has. But my thing is, what's so like, wow, it's over a whole year. 14 months. Over out at sea. Mm-hmm. That is crazy. Crazy, Straight bro. Straight survival mode. And then f- for you just to wash up on the shore and... Just drift to land and then just That's so all happen he to could come do. across... Yeah, and to come across this... Eventually, he, he was going to continue because he wasn't giving up. Yeah. Even if he had stayed... If he stayed out there for over a year, just drifting, trust and believe he was going to continue just to drift until he landed somewhere. He wasn't gonna give up, and he was he was well okay with eating the way he was eating. What yeah. other reason why he not, for him not to su- survive? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? He he was gonna survive eventually. He was gonna land somewhere. Yeah. But for y'all to like like criticize and be skeptics of like he's probably like y'all go out there and try and see how long you survive. Probably won't even survive a month out there, let alone a week. You know what I'm saying? So, yo, all to Jose, man. That was... That and too. rest in peace to Ezekiel. Yeah, facts. Yeah. That too as well. But a lot of people probably would have gave up kind of like Ezekiel did. After months, he it was after, what, four months he gave up? Kind of basically gave up? Now, I know when that first story, I was talking about, you know, straight survival mode. and Because I'm on land. I can make some <laughs> things work. But water, baby, after the after that, well, I don't, that, that's the thing, I know. don't know. But it's just the thing, like, I'm not jumping in the water, just be yeah. catching nothing, honey. So, I'm like, what am I But if you with Jose, Jose is, is... No, if I'm with Jose, yeah, but I'm just saying uh, Now, if myself. I'm with Jose, you know what I'm saying, I'm, I'm going to fight with you, Jose. Yeah, we, 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 we go thug this thing <laughs> out. But, um, hey, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. In 1971, Julianne Kepka was a bright-eyed German teenager who had just graduated high school. On Christmas Eve of 1971, she and her mother were at the airport in Lima, Peru, waiting for a flight to Pacopa to visit her father, who was a zoologist working in the Amazon. She and her mother and everybody else waiting for this flight were really annoyed because the flight was seven hours late due to bad weather. Finally, it arrived and Julianne, her mother, and everybody else who had been waiting boarded Lanza Flight 508. And immediately after takeoff, they started hitting some pretty bad turbulence because of the bad weather. But Julianne really liked flying, so she didn't mind. Her mother, on the other hand, was white knuckling the armrests. But after 10 minutes or so, as they were getting nearer to cruising altitude, the turbulence was not getting any better. In fact, it was getting much worse. And Julianne was starting to get worried herself. And then when the plane started shaking so violently that all of the overhead bins opened up and luggage and wrapped presents and Christmas cakes started pouring out, Julianne now began white knuckling the armrest. As she's sitting there, she looks out the window and she sees all this lightning right outside their window. And it was clear they were literally flying through a lightning storm. And so Julianne and her mother are just looking at each other, unable to speak because they're so scared. And they're listening to the other passengers screaming and yelling and everyone's starting to panic. And then the plane starts really shaking up and down like it's being lifted 50 feet and dropping 50 feet over and over. And then all of a sudden, there's this bright flash inside of the cabin and then the lights go out. And then they look out the left side and they see smoke and flames coming out of the engine that sits on the wing. And then the plane felt like it was just falling from the sky Mm. before it dipped into an aggressive nosedive and just started bombing straight down toward the ground. It turned out that big flash in the cabin was lightning striking the engine. Julianne would say, So he's telling me like, well, this is 1970. What the fuck y'all do? He's telling me you, y'all literally flew right into a, into a fucking lightning storm, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you really putting, don't they supposed to go around those? I mean, I and then know. to be completely honest, 
if y'all know y'all had trouble coming in because of the storm. But if I guess if they have like clearance, we like, okay, the storm Man, has moved. That's just delay the flight. Moves here, whatever. Yeah. My life is more important than a delayed flight. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. It turned out that big flash in the cabin was lightning striking the engine. Julianne would say, despite this unbelievable chaos, the worst moment imaginable, her mother grabbed her by the hand and said, this is it, it's all over. And that was the last thing her mother ever said to her. After that, all Julianne can remember is the sound of other passengers screaming and crying and the awful grinding sounds that the engines were making. And as she's listening to these horrible sounds getting ready to die, all of a sudden the noise just stops and she's outside of the plane. She's still strapped into her seat, but now she's in free fall away from the plane. And she remembers thinking how unbelievably lonely she was. And then she looked down and she saw the canopy of the jungle fast approaching and she knew she was about to die and then she passed out. She remembers nothing of the actual impact, but she would later find out the plane broke up two miles up. So she was in free fall for two miles in that seat before hitting the ground. She woke up the next day looking upwards towards the jungle canopy. And the first thing she said out loud was, I survived. And she's looking around and she yells for her mother, but mm. there's no one around her. No one yells back. And that's when she realizes I'm all alone and probably everybody, including my mother, is dead. She had somehow managed oh. to not only survive, but only have a broken collarbone and some deep cuts in her leg. She could hear planes overhead that were most likely looking for the crash site and potentially survivors, but she couldn't see them because the canopy was so thick, so they couldn't see her. She was wearing a very short sleeveless mini dress and flip-flops, but in fact, she had lost one of her flip-flops, but elected to keep the other one on because she had lost her glasses in the crash and she was incredibly nearsighted. And so she would use this one flip-flop to test the ground ahead of her before committing with her bare foot. Before the crash, she had spent a year and a half at her parents' research station out in the Amazon. And in that time, she'd picked up very valuable survival skills for being in the rainforest. So the first thing she did was stand up and go looking for a stream because her father had told her wherever there's a stream, that stream will oftentimes lead to civilization. Yeah. And so she began walking and sure enough, she found a stream. And instead of just walking next to the stream, she got in it and began walking directly in the middle of the stream because her parents had told her that you're less likely to get attacked by a predator if you're standing in the water versus standing on land. She only walked a little ways before she came across the crash site. There was no bodies, it was just debris, and all she could find that was useful was a small bag of candy. So she took the bag of candy and continued walking down the stream. And for several days, she trudged along, and she would say during the day it was incredibly hot and miserable, and at night it was very cold, and since she only had this small dress on, it was particularly miserable. But she said the scariest part of the whole ordeal was at night when you're trying to sleep, it's totally pitch black and you're in the middle of the Amazon and there's predators all around you. She said it was horrifying. On the fourth day of being in the jungle, as she walked down the stream, she heard the sound of a landing king vulture, a sound that she recognized from her time spent at her parents' Amazon reserve. And the sound of this vulture was just around the corner, so she couldn't see it but she knew these huge vultures only showed up if there's a ton of dead meat. Uh -huh. And so she knew as soon as she rounded that corner, she was going to come face to face with the bodies from the crash, potentially even her mother. Uh -huh. But she kept moving forward, she turned the corner, and sure enough, there were bodies. The vulture took off and what she was left looking at was a bench with three passengers on it still buckled in and wow. all three of their heads had been rammed underneath the earth. They had clearly landed head first. Wow. Immediately, she had an intense sense of panic because she had never seen a dead body before. And I gotta pause on that one and just kinda, that is crazy. I, ain't, I can't take that back because I don't wanna hear it again, mm -hmm. but that is traumatic as fuck. Just to think of two mouths, head first, strapped in, wow. and you going, y'all know how hard the fucking earth is? Have y'all ever failed on the earth? Like, just to feel the impact. Damn. I felt the earth before, like, falling impact-wise. But that's crazy, man. And she thought one of them was her mother.
But when she went over to examine this particular corpse, she saw her toenails were painted pink and her mother never painted her toenails. And so she had this intense sense of relief that it wasn't her mother, but at the same time felt very ashamed of that thought. There was nothing on the three bodies or near them that could help her survive. And so she said her goodbyes and she continued walking down the stream. By the 10th day of this ordeal, she could barely stand straight because of a broken collarbone and the pain in her leg. And so she began drifting down the river in one of the deeper sections. And then she thought she was hallucinating when she saw this big boat docked up against the side of the river. But when she went up to it and touched it, it was real. She went up on shore, she looked inside, there was no one in the boat, but it looked like a boat that was used and there was a path that led back into the jungle. And so she followed the path and it led to this hut and no one was in there, but outside was a jug of gasoline. And she had this wound in her arm that was full of maggots. And she remembered her father using gasoline to get maggots out of a wound in their dog. And so she took the gasoline and dumped it in her arm and she said it was excruciatingly painful, but she was able to pull out 30 maggots and felt very proud of that accomplishment. Wow. After that, she fell asleep inside of the hut and just hoped that whoever lived here eventually showed up. And sure enough, the next day she woke up and she heard two men talking outside that were walking towards her. And she said the sound of their voice was like the sound of an angel. Mm. And when the two men came up the path and saw her, they were obviously very shocked. And they initially thought she was like this water goddess from a local legend that involved a half mermaid, half woman that was light skinned. And she would tell them in Spanish that she's not a water goddess, that in fact she's a girl and she had just survived a plane crash and she really needed their help. It was getting late that day, so they couldn't bring her out of the jungle right away. So they helped treat her wounds, they gave her some food and water, and the next day they brought her back to civilization. The day after her rescue, she was reunited with her father, and apparently he was so overcome with emotion because he believed she was dead, that for several hours he just couldn't speak. Julianne was the sole survivor of the 91 people who boarded Lance Flight 508. Her mother actually survived the crash, but then died several days later because she couldn't move. This is something that haunts Julianne and her family because they think about how horrible those last few moments for her mother must have been. Julianne ultimately recovered from all of her physical injuries, but to this day deals with significant emotional trauma. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret into... Yo, I feel like anybody, anybody who went through that was suffer from any type of trauma that there is. To know that I survived, I'm wondering, looking... And my mom was alive the whole time. Right. And to be honest, if I was able to get to my mom, I could have helped her to survive. Yeah. I think anybody will deal with emotional trauma forever. Wow. And just imagine That's how many imagine, other people yeah. also survived the crash and actually perish because they couldn't move. They stuck could, in a certain could position, couldn't get out of the seatbelt, whatever yeah. you know was. Wow. It had to be more to actually survive, mm -hmm. but did couldn't survive. You get yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? It had to be it had to be more. She just uh, like that is crazy. Even yeah. the pilot, every wow. That is shocking, bro. Man, these stories are crazy. That's amazing as far as like, you know. Yeah. Like her survival skills and the fact that, you know, she already had, you know, learned things. Good thing her dad really her, like yeah. yeah. Mom yeah. and dad, she said she learned from both. Well her but, yeah. but for but sure for her dad yeah. though. Yeah. For mom and dad, but yeah. Yeah. Man, um, any of these situations I would never ever want to be having to experience any mm -mm. of these. Because those to be honest, I don't me right now. Probably can never survive any of those. One, I have lack of sense of direction. Can't swim. Can't, like, I, like this. Yeah. That would, like, I would be, damn, what the hell I do? You know what I'm saying? But, again, like you said pre earlier, previously, you don't know what you are capable of doing until you put in those areas to the, no, into, uh, to the situation into you never situation. know like what information you're as, actually intaking that you might Stuff have to use start coming, you're like, oh my gosh i heard this somewhere yeah. okay i remember here you, you just never know and like, those are survival really school some fight or flight yeah, yeah like it's for real yeah it's scary man for yeah sure. all of these are scary situations uh shout Rest out to, in peace to everyone who lost their life for real man plane. ezekiel uh, 
RIP to him, RIP to to all the individuals who lost, lost their life, their life on, a on a plane crash. Yeah. But shout out to those three individuals who fought, fought all the way to to, to survive mm-hmm. and was able to make it out and tell their story. Right. That's amazing, man. But hey, y'all spam us up. Y'all let Please us know do. y'all thoughts and opinions about it as well. Um, also, again, with the part one, if y'all want to see us do part one, let us know if we're able to find... Because I do know Ballin said previously before he has had to delete videos uh, that people have asked to mm. be removed off of YouTube. So I don't know. It oh, possibly okay. is one okay, of those as well. You, yeah. So if y'all can find it, let us know as well in the comments. But as always, man, y'all know how it go. I do go by the name of Jamie Kitty Sis. We are. We are. Go and get it. Ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't declare me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar. Let me watch out for my partners. Keep my money long. Get my team strong.